So, um, as Chris was saying, I'm a, I'm a traveling musician. Um, I grew up on a little farm in Georgia, in West Georgia. It's a really beautiful place. I uh, lived there from age five until I ran away at 16. And I ran away and thought, what am I doing? This was a beautiful place. But it was a great incubator for a lot of ideas and uh, a mindset that has influenced my life. Um, where I grew up was uh, 90 acres of hay fields and swamps and oak and pine forest. And it was one of those kind of places where everywhere you went, you could feel uh, eyes on you of people who might have been there before and animals and just the, the beautiful uh, surroundings that I got to enjoy. And I wasn't raised with any kind of religion, so my first thoughts about spirituality came from simply observing nature. And there's still some of the key principles that I, I would say my thoughts are governed by. So growing up there, um, a lot of the people that lived around me were, uh, were Baptist, Southern Baptist in particular. The type that uh, get up and clap and roll around on the ground and anoint people with oil <coughs> and services are very lively. And I became uh, curious about what they believed at about 15 years old and started attending their churches and um, had some very beautiful experiences there. Um, in the Southern Baptist faith, every service is ended with what they call an altar call. Uh, maybe some of you have been to one of these services and seen that before. At our church, we had an old, uh, an old tall preacher that always wore a black western suit. He had long white sideburns and a big white pompadour and he was very lively. He was a very soft-spoken man, except for when he would preach, and he did what I called the, uh, the Baptist bark. Anybody ever heard that before? You know, the Lord has gathered us here today. Yeah. Very lively, you know. And uh, they would do this thing, the altar call, where he would ask everyone to bow their head and close their eyes, and then if you didn't know you were going to heaven, you would raise your hand, and you had the opportunity to come to the front and be saved. And I did this after attending their church for about a month, and it was a beautiful experience, and it, uh, it, um, it changed my views up until that point, and it was very, uh, very nice. But after a couple of weeks or so, for some reason that I could never understand, the feeling faded. And I didn't know at that time that sometimes when we have a spiritual high that things kind of fade, and you know, maybe it'll come back in a different form in some different place. And a lot of people talk about different religions as different paths, but I think we all just walk whatever path we're walking, and it may seem like various paths at, at, a, at a different point in your life. But it left me with questions, so I started studying religion. A friend of mine gave me a book on world religions. I read it, was very fascinated by the little um, introductions that I got there to different ways of thinking that had never crossed my mind before. Um, I went on to uh, study with the LDS Church, became a Mormon, served a Mormon mission for two years in Ogden, Utah, and in Wyoming and other parts of northern Utah. And during that time, became uh, converted to the early ideas of Mormonism and became a fundamentalist. And that came to a point where uh, I think the breaking point was when I was meeting with a temple worker in his home in Bountiful, Utah and he brought out his two daughters and asked me to marry them. And wanted me to help him start a uh, kind of a utopian community called a United Order where everything is shared in common. It's an early Mormon idea. Great idea, great theory. Um, moved on from Mormonism, studied Tibetan Buddhism for a number of years, and from there have just picked up whatever books I've come across. And it's kind of come to a point where I don't think there is an absolute way of seeing things that this is the truth, that you can pinpoint it you know, by a certain set of words. But I think that there's beautiful things in all different types of practices. And I would say at this point that me personally, I get my best edification from nature. Um, the little bit of free time I have, I go out on the, on the desert here and I hike and I swim and we live in a place where it's very easy to feel invigorated. Um, I do about 330 shows a year. Um, as this says, before I've 
hitchhiked about uh, 8,000 miles all through my early 20s, all around the country, rode Greyhound buses all around, um, and have just kind of lived a life where I've done as I've pleased. And for the last uh, about five years, that's meant playing music full time. And so my wife is over there, her name Beck is Becca, and we travel around in a van with a little puppy and we play music. And when we're not on the road, we live over here in Washington. Um, this week I'm giving uh, this talk and two others at the Sunstone Symposium, which is a big Mormon conference in Salt Lake. I'm very excited to speak at that because I've been hired to give uh, two talks. One is called My Walk with the Gods, My Experience as a Baptist, a Mormon, a Mormon fundamentalist, a Buddhist, an occultist, and beyond. <laughs> and the other one is called uh, Lucifer, a mistaken and misappropriated deity where I'm basically, basically going to follow 17 different archetypes for the Lightbringer archetype through history all the way back to the ancient Sumerians and basically show that the one that's been vilified has been, the story's been flipped on its head and that's not the way it originally was at all. And it's interesting to see how that influenced early beliefs around the world. So I'm gonna give that lecture to a bunch of Mormons. It's gonna be fun. So, it's on to the music. <laughs> so I, uh, I've always been interested in music. Um, my introduction to it was when I was nine years old. We have a small family. I'm, I was an only child. And we also were a very uh, poor family. So for holidays, uh, the extended family, which was about eight or nine of us, would uh, draw names from a hat, and whoever's name you got, you got them a present. And you had to open that gift in front of everybody. So you better pretend like you like it. And that's what I had to do, because this was the era of Nintendo games. I'm 37 years old, and when I was a kid, Nintendo was what you wanted, and I wanted a Nintendo as well. And I asked for one, and I was as good as I could be. And when, uh, <laughs> when my gift came, it was a little box, about that big. And I thought, oh man, this is definitely not a Nintendo. And the worst part about it was, is that it was my grandmother's friend who had given me the gift. So, you know, it's probably going to be like some hard candy or something, you know. And I have to open this gift in front of everybody and pretend like I like it, even though I probably wouldn't. And I opened it, and it was a harmonica. Yeah. <laughs> it was a harmonica. I remember the old lady, she looked at me, and she did that kind of, <laughs> you know, that like she knew something I didn't know. And uh, I took my harmonica, I said, thank you. And I walked into the other room, and I kind of blew into it a little bit. And I thought, man, this sucks. <laughs> harmonica. But I worked on the hay fields, and uh, whenever we got a break, we'd go sit in the sun, in the shade, and my mom would bring us out sweet tea, and I'd play my harmonica. And uh, I learned to love it. So I would, uh, I would hitchhike, and I found that uh, standing on the side of the road with your thumb up, you're not going to go anywhere. So what I did, I went to truck stops, and I played my harmonica. People would gather around, and we'd talk. And I'd say, where are you going, or where are you going? And I was able to hitchhike 8,000 miles over four years. And saw so many incredible things. And met so many amazing people. And when I was little, all I wanted to be was a traveler. And I was able to do it. I sang for a bunch of different bands over the years. And then at uh, 32 years old, I, I bought this guitar. Started playing it. And my grandmother then told me, that my great-grandfather had been a country singer and that he had played at the Grand Old Opry with uh, Hank Williams Sr. Wow. and uh, played up until the last day of his life when he was playing at a Holiday Inn in Atlanta and died of a heart attack in the parking lot while he was on a cigarette break at his show. <laughs> and, you know, his music's over there on my live CD with mine. But uh, what got me really on the road playing music was a homeless man. I was, uh, 
I was in Salt Lake and I used to live by Pioneer Park mm -hmm. and I was walking by on a spring day and I saw a middle-aged black man in a black chef's uniform meditating under a tree. Everybody, everybody around him was uh, drinking mouthwash and fist fighting and doing drugs. And this man's just sitting there, just totally calm. And I went over and talked to him after seeing him for months and months. And I sat down and waited for him to open his eyes, and he did. And he had a beautiful smile. It was just one of the most peaceful looking people I'd ever seen in my life. And I said, what's your story? Why do you sit under this tree and meditate every day? And he looked at me with that smile on his face and he said, oh, I'm, I'm dying. And I said, oh, you mean metaphorically, right? He said, no, no, I have cancer. I'm very sick. And I said, I'm so sorry to hear that. And he says, oh, yeah. Yeah, me too. It was really horrible news when I first got it. And I said, well, how did you end up here? Why the chef's uniform? He said, well, I was a chef in Las Vegas he was originally from Compton, California, and uh, his back had been hurting for a while, but he had no time to stop and look into it. And after the pain got so severe, he finally went to the doctor and they ran some tests, and that's when they told him, you're not, you have cancer, and it's too late to do anything about it. He went home and he said he destroyed his entire apartment. He punched holes in the walls, flipped over everything he owned, just destroyed the place in a rage. He felt so cheated. And then he fell on the ground and he sobbed and cried until he passed out. And when he woke up in the morning, he had two problems. He's dying, and now he has no self-respect. He looks around, he sees all the chaos, and he got up. And he said he didn't know what he was doing, but he just walked out the front door. He says, I left the door open and I just walked away. And he started hitchhiking. He'd never hitchhiked before. He ended up a few days later in Salt Lake and Pioneer Park. And he said he saw the sun coming through the trees, and it was the first time he'd smiled since getting the news he was going to die. He decided he was going to sit down on the ground, and much like Buddha had done thousands of years before him, he decided he wasn't going to get up until he was over his fears. So he'd been, he'd been sitting there for about three months. I met him. And uh, he asked me, he said, uh, you're pretty young right now, but one day you're going to die. And he said, uh, where will you be when that time comes to die? And I said, I have no idea. Shortly after that, I went on my first tour for a month from Utah to Savannah, Georgia and back and uh, met up with him again. At this point, he was pretty frail, pretty sick, but he was still smiling, still sitting under his tree. <laughs> he says, well, what now? What do you think you're going to do? You've already quit your job. And you went on the road. I said, well... I think I'll practice guitar a little bit longer and maybe one day play some more shows. And he said, no, don't be a coward. Go out there and play music. Do it like your great grandfather did until you die. So I wrote this song, it's on my live album. It's called, If I Could Die Anywhere. If I could die anywhere, you know I'd die somewhere in Salt Lake City, somewhere so beautiful and so pretty, where I could see people falling in love, the most beautiful scenery you've ever dreamed of. If I could die anywhere, you know I'd die somewhere in Pioneer Park, where I saw a young girl sharing bread with an old man in the dark.
share the love it was not yet there. There like you used to do Oh, like you used to do That's what I've been doing. Just been on the road playing music. Uh, like I said I do about 330 shows a year. I was in Kanab last night. Uh, we leave tomorrow for a, a trip that'll be about a month long. It'll take us through Utah, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. Um, and it's uh, it's a good way to live your life. I did think I could do it at first, and uh, I met a lot of people on the way that uh, just kind of showed me how it's done, you know. And, mm. and, uh, it's a good experience, and, and I think that it's important to just remember, I, I read one time that uh, samurais in ancient Japan used to meditate every day on the inevitability of death. It sounds pretty dark, but uh, you know, maybe you don't need to sit and think about dying for an hour or two a day, but, but it's, uh, it's important to know that we are mortal, and uh, life is short, and I think it, no matter what time it comes, we're probably going to wish there was more time, and we won't be able to control that, but we can control how we live. And it's very important to get out and do those things that bring you real joy and happiness. And uh, after all the different uh, studying I've done and, and the things that I'm, I've learned and am continuing to learn, um, I define my philosophy now uh, by what I call my personal belief system. It's called HOWL, H-O-W-L. It's the Holy Order of Wildlife. I like to look for examples in nature. I think that animals and nature are far more enlightened than we could ever dream to be. And we'd do better just to watch them and do the way they do. And uh, we used to have gatherings up on top of Dixie Rock every Sunday when I was around more. And we'd get together and, 
and do a little bit of basic yoga and meditation and and uh, Chris would play a hand pan and we'd talk about things but uh, one thing I do at all my shows because I think it snaps people out of their rigid ways and I'd like to invite you to do it with me is uh, to howl with me <laughs> so on the count of three I want you to put all you got into it like the wild animals that's really what you are down at the core whatever that means to you are you ready? All right. ready. One, two, three. <laughs> I recommend next time it's a real pretty Southern Utah night, go out somewhere or in your backyard, whatever. Just do it quick. They won't even know where it came from. Get in a couple good house. It's good for you. It's good for you. It gets you out of thinking like a normal person and it's just liberating and exciting. I do it all the time, just driving down the road. You know, I hear you see a lot of beautiful stuff and that's just kind of my go-to reaction. And uh, the motto of how, um, I don't claim to know anything, and I don't think any of us can truly know anything for absolute certainty. And uh, the motto of Hal is, I am constantly in awe of the great mystery which surrounds us. And to me, that's been the most healthy spiritual summation of beliefs that I can have. And I do have uh, some just simple flyers and things over there, and copies of Utah Stories magazine. I write for the magazine. Those are free. I've got other stuff as well if you're interested. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Sorry I cry like that. It just happens. And uh, it's been a great pleasure, and I hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.